Well, I want to welcome you to, to Big Valley Grace Community Church. We're really glad that you're here. We're glad that you made a decision to come to church this weekend and that you picked us, that you picked this place to come to. And uh, I hope that if it's your first time with us today, that you just really enjoy yourself, that you just really enjoy the service, and uh, just, just want you to know that we're really glad that you're here, that you're welcome in this place. We want to welcome everybody who's over in the venue worship community as well. I'm actually us- usually with you over there, and so it's fun to be on this side of the camera from you tonight. I hope you guys are having a good time over there. And then anybody who's watching online or listening on the radio, we're glad that you're with us. Uh, we've been in a great series entitled The Parables of Jesus Christ, and I want to encourage you to utilize your note sheets tonight. Those will be really helpful as we walk through a passage together, as we walk through a parable together. This will be helpful as you're following along. And parables are designed to teach, to teach truth through stories. And uh, stories are fun because stories connect people and they connect experiences, um, and, and they connect it all together. And tonight, Uh, We have the privilege as a group, as a worship community, to be connected through parable story to God's truth. And Jesus explained a little bit about parables to his disciples, and we're going to be hanging out a lot in Matthew chapter 13 tonight. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to be looking at a a bunch of different sections of it. But in verse 10, uh, speaking to why we have parables, why Jesus used parables, he says, it says about Jesus that the disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you and not to them. And whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, They do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they've closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, and they would hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts. In turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Sharing stories in parable form. It's this chosen method that Jesus just loves to use to display the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus designed these parables uh, pretty strategically because he designed them to kind of lock away spiritual mysteries and to kind of make them out of reach of the faithless, the religious, the self-righteous, those who had hard hearts, closed ears, um, closed eyes. But in his brilliance, he also designed them to kind of work twofold. Because they unlock spiritual mysteries for his disciples, those who had soft hearts, open eyes, and listening ears. So they lock them away from one group, and they unlock them for another group. And as we approach today's parable, uh, if you and I want to unlock the gift that God wants to give us, the the spiritual mystery, the the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven that he wants to have for us, um, he kind of explained how that's going to happen, and it's with eyes that are willing to see, and ears that are willing to listen, and hearts that are submissive and surrendered to him. And so now we come to the parable of the weeds, and it's in Matthew chapter 13. In verse 24, it says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then he went away. And the wheat sprouted and formed heads, and then the weeds also appeared. And the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at that time I will tell the harvesters, 
First, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then, gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Now, this parable starts off with, the kingdom of heaven is like. And once again, Jesus is using the parable to either lock away spiritual truths from the unbeliever or to unlock spiritual truths for the believer. And so the question is, what is the spiritual truth that is pertaining to the kingdom of heaven that Jesus has designed this parable around? And this parable is about judgment. It's about the system of judgment. And so he's telling a story that has a spiritual truth about the mystery of the God's system of judgment as it pertains to the kingdom of heaven. And through humble hearts and open ears and listening ears and open eyes, you know, we can get excited that God has a gift that he wants to give us tonight. He has a, he has a, a secret of the kingdom of heaven that he wants us to know. Father God, Lord, I pray that as we uh, continue to walk through this parable, God, Lord, would you teach us whatever it is you want us to know? God, whatever it is you want us to understand about judgment tonight. And so, Father, protect us. Help us to have listening ears and open eyes and humble hearts. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's family said, amen. Now, beginning in your notes right at the top, I can begin to understand God's system of judgment by unlocking the parable of the weeds with three keys. I can begin to understand God's system of judgment by unlocking the parable of the weeds with three keys. And these three keys, when kind of placed into the lock of this story, will reveal the truth of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus designed this parable to display. And we can use those keys right now to unlock it. And key number one is this. It's the insight of God. Key number one is the insight of God. And the insight of God is the key that unlocks our eyes so that we can see what God wants to show us in the parable of the weeds. And there's no one better to explain the meaning behind the parable of the weeds than the one who designed it, and that would be Jesus. And shortly after Jesus teaches the parable, he explains it when he's with his disciples all alone. And later on in Matthew 13, in, in verse 36, it says this, then he left the crowd, so he went away from the big group that he told the parable to, and then he went into the house privately. He, his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parables of the weeds in the field. And this is the name the disciples gave the parable. Jesus didn't name the parable, but they identified with the weeds. And so they said, hey, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. And as the weeds are pulled out, pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This first key, it's the insight of God. And the insight of God unlocks our eyes so that we can see God's system of judgment from his perspective. And this key unlocks the spiritual truths regarding the field's owner, in the parable. And the first thing we need to know about the inside of God is this, and this is 1A in your notes, that God sees deception with discernment. That God sees the deception and he discerns what it is. He sees it and he understands it. It says in verse 26, when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. And so the owner's servants came to him and said, sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. In verse 37, he answered, The one who sowed good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. And the weeds are the people of the evil one. 
and the enemy who sows them is the devil. God discerns the wheat as the people of the kingdom, but God also discerns the deception that's taking place, the weeds as the people of the evil one, and the enemy as the devil. And so this insight of God, this first key, the insight of God, it unlocks our eyes so that we can see God's system of judgment from his perspective. And the second thing we need to know about the inside of God is this. This is one B in your notes, that God sees options in the outcome. The first thing is that God sees deception with discernment, but the second thing is that God sees options in the outcome. In verse 30, it says this, let b- both grow together, speaking of the wheat and the weeds, until the harvest, and that's kind of a key phrase, until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters, first, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. And he goes on in verse 39, the harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. And as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil, and they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. And so God sees options. There are options in the way that this all goes down, in the way that the story ends. There's options in the outcome. God discerns the deception that has taken place, and he has a plan to deal with it. He sees options. Jesus identifies the harvest at the, as the end of the age. And the end of the age is the end of the age that we're currently living in. The age where there are weeds among the wheat. And Jesus sees the outcome for the weeds. They'll be collected, tied into bundles to be burned. Why? Because there's coming a time when Jesus is going to weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. But Jesus also sees the outcome for the wheat, that they'll be gathered and they'll be brought into his barn. Why? Because there's coming a time when Jesus is going to cause the righteous to shine like the sun in the kingdom of God. And so God sees these options in the outcome. The weeds are burned. The wheat is barned. Sin and the evil ones are destroyed, and the righteous are displayed. And so without the inside of God, the, the mysteries of the kingdom, man, they stay, they stay locked away. We can't understand them. But the inside of God gains us access to these secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the third thing we need to know about the inside of God is, is this. This is one C in your notes, that God sees patience as purposeful. God sees patience as purposeful. In verse 28, it says again, an enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? I mean, you got to admire the servants. I mean, they want to get the job done. And he says, no, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow until the harvest. And in 37, again, he says, he answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The owner of the field is the son of man. That's, Jesus, it's his favorite name for himself. He, he's talking about himself. He's the son of man. And the field is the the world, and the owner owns the field, which means Jesus owns the world. And the good seed is the people of the kingdom, citizens of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is highly invested in the success of the seed that he has planted, similar to the high investment that our agricultural community in this area is invested in the seed that they have planted. Planted, which is why many people have been praying for rain, that God would bring water to this area to water those seeds. And Jesus doesn't want his servants making judgments of who is wheat and who is weed. Jesus doesn't want his servants to start yanking out the weeds of this world. Why? Because according to Jesus, if 
the servants start removing the weeds on their own, they're going to uproot the wheat as well. And so what is Jesus saying? Jesus is explaining that if his servants take it upon themselves to be the judge of the world, to make judgments about who is righteous and who is evil, and then taking action to remove the evil people of the world, damage will come to the righteous. The servants of Jesus do not have the ability to fully discern. Remember that was point one, that he sees discernment. He sees the deception with discernment. The servants of Jesus don't fully discern. They don't have the ability to fully discern the deception and to accurately see how the options unfold towards the outcome. In fact, Jesus tells another story, um, another parable to explain how the inside of God is, is different than our insight. And this is in Luke chapter 18. And in Luke chapter 18, Jesus says this, To some who were confident in their own righteousness, and they looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, (laughs) robbers and evildoers, adulterers. Or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus says this, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus is giving an example of how looks can be deceiving when it comes to justification before God. Most would have thought that surely the the religious guy, right, he's an example of wheat, or righteousness. I mean, he's doing all the right stuff. And the tax collector, well, he's a crook, right? So um, he's obviously a weed and an evil person, right? But Jesus illustrates how God sees the condition of the heart and makes judgments that are superior to ours. And he chooses to be patient because he has an incredible purpose behind his patience. Peter kind of lets us in on a little secret about the heart of God in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, and that promise is that he's going to come back and he's going to take us to be with him. That's the promise that God has made to us. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. He is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God is allowing time to pass, time for repentance. In our passage in Matthew 13, in verse 28, it says, an enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull him up? No, he answered. Because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Think about it. Maybe God's allowing time for the weeds to become wheat. I mean, all wheat started out as a weed. I was born into sin. You were born into sin. We were weeds. We all have to die to the flesh. We all have to be reborn in the spirit. You and I cannot be the final judge of where people are in the regeneration process with Jesus Christ. I don't have that right to look into your life. And you don't have that right to look into my life and to determine where I'm at in salvation. 
That's not, God's not asking you and me to be the judge. Does God want his servants to take it upon themselves to judge the weed and to yank them out of this world? Holy justice. No. It's not what he wants. God is protecting the wheat from being uprooted by our bad judgments, by my bad judgments. And maybe he's protecting the weeds that are eventually going to become wheat. God is being patient, not wanting anyone to perish. He wants to wait until the time is right. And he's protecting the wheat in the process. The insight of God allows him to be patient with a purpose. Now, the insight of God is an important key, and it really changes how we understand this parable. The insight of God allows him to discern the deception, to see the, op- the optional outcomes, to see them accurately. And the insight of God shows that, that there's an incredible purpose in the way that he is being patient. Now, the second key is this. It's the, it's the key that we, we further kind of put into the lock of the story to, to unlock more truth, and it's the impact on unbelievers. That's key number two. It's the impact on unbelievers. And the impo- impact on unbelievers is the key that unlocks our ears because God wants to speak to us, and he wants us to hear some things that are pretty important in this parable. And this is the key that unlocks spiritual truth regarding the weeds Now, the first thing we need to know about the impact on unbelievers is this. It says 2A. Unbelievers are manipulated by Satan. Unbelievers are manipulated by Satan. Now, this whole section, key number two, it's no fun to talk about. It's uh, it's super sobering. It's really sad. Because the truth is, is that the original design for the world or the field, as in this parable, is that it would be planted with good seed, that it would be watered by the good farmer, and it would be harvested for a good crop. But the enemy tried to screw up the whole plan, and Satan totally manipulates people and and tries to make this good situation turn into evil. And it started in the Garden of Eden with our first parents, right? Satan comes in and he manipulates the situation for evil. And from Adam and Eve, we inherited to all of humanity the sinful, sinful nature. In verse 25 in our parable, it says, while everyone was sleeping, and they're not sleeping because they're lazy, they're sleeping because farmers work hard and they deserve to have sleep. In fact, the scripture says that God grants sleep to those he loves. So when you go home tonight and you put your head on your pillow and, and you start zing away, I mean, just that's God's love in your life, okay? It's good. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then he went away. Just like the devil. Come in, screw it up, and then take off. Verse 38, the field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The devil orchestrates disaster, and he is all about manipulating people for evil. Now, the second thing we need to know about the impact on unbelievers is this. This is 2B, that unbelievers for a season are allowed to exist, permeate, and grow using the the terminology from this parable. They're allowed to exist, permeate, and grow as weeds. 25, while everyone was sleeping, his enemies came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then he went away. And the idea here isn't like just a single weed, or that there's like a, a sprinkling. But the idea here is that the field is now saturated with weeds, that there's weeds surrounding all of the wheat. And the, the enemy, he sowed weeds everywhere in the field. Now, sowing weeds into a field, that's a pretty good way to screw up your neighbor's field, right? I mean, that's, I mean well, I'm the type of gardener where I plant a flower and the only thing that grows is weeds. But, I mean, in the sense of the farming community, I mean, you want to mess up your neighbor, right? Go and just sow weeds all throughout their field. 
And that kind of falls in line with the character of Satan because he has one goal, steal, kill, destroy. In verse 28, an enemy did this, Jesus replied, or the owner of the field. And the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together. So there's a permission for the weeds to, to exist, to, to have permeated the field, to be growing right now. And, and through this story, we can clearly see that for a season, for a season, until the harvest, for a season, that God is allowing weeds to exist in the field. He's allowing weeds to permeate the field. He's allowing weeds to grow in the field, but only for a season. And the third thing we need to know about the impact on unbelievers is, is this, and this is 2C, that unbelievers will be removed harshly. Unbelievers will be removed harshly. In verse 30, let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. And then verse 40, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin, all who do evil, and they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he ends verse 43 with, whoever has ears, please let them hear. It's like over and over, Christ is just saying, please listen to what the reality is. Please listen to what I'm trying to tell you. The season of the weeds among the wheat will come to an end. It's the end of the age. And at the harvest time, weeds will be removed, pulled up out of the ground, bundled together, and prepared to be burned. And Jesus will send out his angels to harvest. And everything that causes sin and all who do evil will be weeded out of his kingdom. It's going to be, it's going to be horrible. This is not a good moment. It's a bad moment. It's a bad moment if you're a weed. A real bad moment. It's going to be horrific. The angels will throw them into the blazing furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus is hoping that people are going to hear the truth and that they will listen. The impact on unbelievers, it's torturous. It's horrible. And this is the key that unlocks our ears so that we can hear what God is wanting to say to us through this parable. Now, remember the reason that Jesus gave for speaking in parables. We looked at it already once before. It's at the beginning of Matthew chapter 13. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Do you see the heart of Jesus? He wants to heal. He wants to offer healing. The impact is real. Now, remember the reason that Peter gave for God's patience. We looked at this verse already. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as un some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. What is God's heart? It's patience. He's not wanting anyone to perish because the, the perishing, it's going to be really, really horrible. You know, John 3.16, uh, we're coming up on Super Bowl here, Super Bowl weekend. There's probably going to be a dude with his shirt off that has John 3.16 painted on his chest or something um, tomorrow. And this verse is so popular, we can forget what it says, what it means. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
the most famous verse of Scripture has in it the very clear understanding that there's going to be some perishing. And it's God's heart that we would believe in Jesus Christ so that we would not perish but have eternal life. We can get so used to hearing a popular verse like John 3.16 that when we say the word perish, it doesn't even grip our hearts anymore. We don't, we don't feel it deep down, this word perish. It just kind of becomes normal, you know, every day, rolls off the tongue, it's easy to say. But here's, here's the real truth. Without Jesus, all that is left for us is to perish. Without Jesus, all that is left is to perish. The impact on unbelievers is manipulation by Satan in a season marked by an allowance to exist, permeate, and grow, but ending very, very harshly. Now we got one more key. Key number three to kind of unlock what Jesus is wanting to tell us is the implications for believers. The implications for believers. And the implications for believers is the key that unlocks our hearts so that we can surrender. We can say, okay, God, I'm ready. What do you want me to do? I'm surrendered to you. That God would soften us through the parable of the weeds. And I believe that in my own life, this is where God has been working in me as I've been preparing. Is that God would soften me. That he would soften my judgmental spirit. That he would soften my judging. This is the key that unlocks spiritual truth regarding the field's wheat. And the first thing we need to know about the implications for believers is this, and this is 3A, that believers are planted in the world by Jesus. That believers are planted in the world by Jesus. Jesus. In verse 24, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. In verse 37, he answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. Jesus intentionally planted the people of the kingdom of heaven in the world. So what does this mean? Well, any attempts to isolate Christians from the world is in direct opposition to where Christians have been strategically placed. Uh, Using the imagery from this parable, it would be like saying this, Christian attempting to avoid the world is wheat attempting to avoid the field. In John 17, 14 through 18, Jesus makes it really clear for us. He's praying to the Father. He says this, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world. I'm going to say that again, just as Jesus praying to the Father. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you, he's speaking to the Father, sent me into the world. This is Jesus. The Father has sent Jesus into the world. I, Jesus, have sent them into the world. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. The owner planted good seed in the field, and he did it on purpose. It wasn't an accident. Christians are not of the world, but no, make no mistake about it, Christians are sent into the world purposefully. Now, the second thing we need to know about implications for believers is this, and this is 3B in your notes, that believers are expected to mature in the world for Jesus. Believers are expected to mature in the world for Jesus. In verse 26, it says, when the wheat sprouted, And formed heads. Then the weeds also appeared. And the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? 
Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in the bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Wheat is meant to mature. And wheat is planted to, to sprout and to grow. And there's a really cool picture of, of the disciples kind of pursuing this process, even in the parable, because in verse 36, it says that when they left the crowd and they went privately into the house, it says that his disciples came to him and said, explain to us this parable. Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And in this moment right here, the disciples are growing. They're maturing because they're going to Jesus and they're going, teach us. Well, what is it that you want? What is it that you're saying? What is, it, what is it that you want us to know? In verse 43, Jesus kind of unpacks something really, really important about the maturity of a wheat. Because it says, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of of their father. This is a picture of mature wheat. Now, the people of the kingdom are meant to grow. And the difficulties that sin and evil and hardship and persecution, man, those are being used by God in our lives to help us grow. Those aren't keeping us from growing. Those are helping us to grow because according to Peter in 1 Peter 5, 10, it says, in the great God of all grace who called you to this eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered for a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. Just because there's sin and evil in the world doesn't mean that we are forced to abandon spiritual growth because it's difficult. Because here's why. It's difficult. And just because there's sin and junk and stuff in this world doesn't mean we have to give up all hope of pressing forward with the Lord Jesus Christ and growing in him and maturing in him. In John 16, 33, a weird, weird promise that Jesus makes. I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In me you have peace. In this world you will have peace trouble. It's funny, that's never one of those promises on the daily devotional things. You know what I'm saying? That's never the ones where it just opens it up and it's like, oh, today I'm going to have trouble. All right, it just, that's not the one that they use, but it's there. It's pretty clear. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. As a follower of Jesus, you are not of the world, but you have been sent into it. And it's going to be difficult. It is going to be difficult, which is part of the spiritually maturing process that God is forming within you, which leads us right into the third thing that we need to know about implications for believers. And this is 3C in your notes, that believers have opportunity to impact the world for Jesus. Believers have opportunity to impact, to make an impact in this world for Jesus. Now, let's be reminded about the state of the world. We've, we've read this already, but in verse 15, for this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They've closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and they would turn, and I would heal them. Now, let's be reminded of the time frame that we're working in here, because there's a time frame on this until the harvest. Verse 28, an enemy did this. He replied, the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. There's a time frame, and we have an opportunity to impact in this time frame. But we also need to be reminded of the power of God's presence in us that this parable is saying. In verse 38, the field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The good seed stands 
for the people of the kingdom. You know what? The world's full of weeds. It's going to stay that way until the harvest. The world is full of weeds. It's going to stay that way until the harvest. And weeds can be a really powerful force that can jack a lot of junk up. They can just mess things up. But that's not the only power that's at work in the world. Because the good seed, it stands for the people of the kingdom. And the people of the kingdom stand for the king. And when the world is full of maturing wheat, kingdom-minded people taking advantage of every moment as they exist alongside weeds, amazing things are going to happen for Jesus Christ. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now because I was thinking it too. And this is the, uh, you know, religious person in me thinking it. And so I'm going to assume someone else is thinking it. Otherwise, I need to be admitted to a hospital or something, and I'm alone in this. Um, If the weeds are going to be bundled up and burned, what's the point, right? If the weeds are going to be bundled up and burned, what am I supposed to do about it as a stock of wheat? Well, Jesus himself gives us one of the most upfront and personal examples of what to do. It's, it's in your face, bold, of how kingdom people of heaven should be impacting the lost world that they've been sent into. And this is in John chapter 13. And in John chapter 13, it says this, It was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. To betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. And so he got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing, and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet and then drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Don't forget verse 2, that the devil had already prompted Judas, and that he was going to betray Jesus, and Jesus is drying his feet. Verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? Jesus asked this question. Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. But now that I your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And then in verse 18, I'm not referring to, referring to all of you, and he's talking about the betrayal piece. I'm not referring to all of you because I know those that I've chosen. But this is to fulfill the passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. And after he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit, and he testified, very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. And his disciples, they stared at one another at a loss. Which one did Jesus mean? One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and this is John's code word for going, I'm the one that Jesus loved the most. (laughs) I'm his favorite. Um, Which is funny because Countryman said he was God's favorite last week. But anyway, um, (laughs) when he gets to heaven, him and John will have to have a discussion about that. But uh, he says the the one that, that, that Jesus loved was reclining next to Jesus. And Simon... Peter motioned to this disciple, hey, come here, and and asked him, which one does he mean? Ask him, which one does he mean? And so the disciple whom Jesus loved, this is John, he leans back into Jesus, and he asked him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, 
It's the one whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it into the dish. And then dipping the piece of the bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And as, Jesus, as, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. Now, Jesus knew that Judas, the weed, was going to betray him. Jesus knew that. It said that right there in the passage. And Jesus washed Judas's feet anyway. He washed the dirty, grimy feet of a two-faced, backstabbing weed named Judas. Jesus Jesus knew that Judas, the weed, was going to be manipulated by Satan for evil. And Jesus shared a meal with him, the same food, dipping into the same dish. breaking bread with him, sharing food with a traitor. He's a total traitor. He performed an act of highest treason against the king of all kings. And Jesus got up close and personal with him. Jesus got up close and personal with the weeds of the world. Jesus took the role of the servant and he showed kindness and he showed love and he showed mercy to the weeds of this world. In James 2, 12 through 13, it says this, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Why? Because mercy triumphs over judgment. You and I can spend all our time focusing on everything that's wrong in this world. Oh man, that's wrong, and he's wrong, and she's wrong, and that's wrong, and they're wrong. Everything that's broken, everyone who's evil, we can judge them for it. We can, we can take that stance. Or we can pick up some keys to unlock some mysterious spiritual truths that Jesus is wanting us to know about. Truths about God. To use the inside of God to understand the horrific impact that judgment will have on unbelievers and to utilize every opportunity as a follower of the King Jesus Christ who took on the role, humbled himself as a servant to offer mercy instead of judgment. Because here's the big idea. We need to stop pulling weeds and we need to start planting seeds. We need to stop judging the weeds pulling the weeds, and we need to start planting seeds. Right after Jesus had washed the disciples' feet, including Judas, the betrayer, right, the total traitor, he said this, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus, as God, has the full right in that moment to judge Judas. Jesus could have judged Judas right then, convicting him for eternity, But instead, Jesus offers him mercy. Jesus plants seeds. He serves him by setting the example for us to follow. In this very moment, Jesus allows mercy to triumph over judgment. Later on at dinner that night, Jesus says this in verse 34 in John chapter 13. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus establishes a new command, the command to love one another. And then he makes a very interesting statement. And by this, referring to love one another command, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The reason that love marks a disciple is because love is the mark of Jesus Christ. John 3.16, again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God the Father is love. Jesus the Son is love. God the Father is a giver. And Jesus the Son is the gift. 
And God the Father gave Jesus the Son so that you would believe in him, that you would believe that Jesus is Lord, that you would recognize the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for you, that you would confess that God raised Jesus from the dead. In John chapter 6, 53, it says this, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food. My blood, it's real drink. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Now at this moment, I want to invite our communion team to go ahead and come forward and to begin passing out the elements. In just a moment over in the venue, you're going to have an opportunity to come forward and to receive the elements over there. But communion is a picture of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The flesh of Jesus, his body broken for you and me, it's pictured in the bread. And whoever feeds on the bread of Jesus has eternal life, remains in Jesus, and will live forever. The blood of Jesus, spilled out for you and spilled out for me, it's a picture of the juice from the grapes. And whoever drinks from the cup of Jesus has eternal life, remains in Jesus, will live forever. And communion is a picture of how mercy has triumphed over judgment. God's judgment is poured out on Jesus, breaking his body, spilling his blood, so that you and I might believe in Jesus as Lord, accepting his sacrifice as payment for our sins. And then get this, that we might receive grace and mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, maybe today you're gripped by judgment. There's a weed in your life and all you want to do is just pluck it out. You want to bundle that weed up. You want to throw it in the fire. You know, I'm just hoping that together we can learn a little bit from understanding God's system of judgment tonight. That the inside of God, the impact on unbelievers and the implication for believers, that we may be reminded that, that every stalk of wheat was once a weed. In Romans 5, 6 through 8, you see at just the right time, when we were all still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Yet rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And communion is a picture of mercy triumphing over judgment. And if you aren't trusting in God's mercy, then it won't make any sense for you to (laughs) take communion. That, That won't make any sense. Because communion's a picture of us trusting in the mercy of Jesus Christ. But if you are trusting in God's mercy, trusting in Jesus Christ, then communion is a beautiful reminder of how the mercy of God triumphs over judgment in your own life. You know, once you receive the elements, and in a moment over in the venue, you can walk forward and get the elements. Just, just take a moment, maybe, on your own. Just, just be prayerful. Be reminded reflect on how the body of Jesus has been broken for you and how the blood of Jesus was spilled out for you and how that is a picture of how mercy has triumphed over judgment in your own life. And after you've thanked God on your own, you've had that quiet time, you've prayed, you've reflected, um, maybe you've even rejoiced some, just thanking God, being rejoiceful for what he's done for you. I just want to encourage you to just take communion on your own. Just have that be a private moment between you and Jesus whenever you're ready just to take the communion. Maybe just to consider how you can stop judging the weeds and start planting some seeds for Jesus Christ, just like Jesus Christ did for us. Father God, Lord, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for planting good seeds. And as we remember your sacrifice by worshiping through communion, may we receive with joy the meal that you serve us May we really enjoy ourselves as we focus time to be alone together with you. And so, Father, we pray this in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and all God's people said, amen.